Hello Bio 101 and welcome to this week's lab, mitosis and meiosis. The purpose of this pre-lab video is to prepare you to do two things. One is to complete the worksheet, which you found posted on Discovery, and the second is to be able to do very well on this week's lab quiz. We're going to begin our discussion with mitosis. Mitosis is a means by which all cells except for the gametes, in other words the sex cells, the egg and the sperm, divide. Mitosis is used for three reasons. Growth, when organisms simply increase in size. Repair, when organisms fix part of their body, such as when you uh, scrape your knee and the cells uh, regenerate and your skin heals. And number three, some organisms, but not mammals, use this means of cellular division for asexual reproduction. And so the key thing to remember in the case of mitosis is that it produces cells that are identical to the parent cells. After mitosis, you end up with two cells that are identical, exactly the same. What we see is that there are three stages to cell division. And those three stages are interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. And these stages are each tied to this process of the, the one cell becoming two. And so we talk about each of these briefly in our discussion today. We see them listed on the screen, interphase, mitosis, and then cytokinesis. Now, what we see is that most of a cell's life is spent in interphase. So for instance, the skin cells that you see on your body are cells that are in interphase. We can tell that most of a cell's life is spent in interphase by looking at the little chart that we see on our slide. What we notice is that interphase is green, mitosis is blue, and cytokinesis is purple. So most of the circle is green, indicating that most of the life of the cell is spent in interphase. There are three stages to interphase. G, which stands for growth, one, in which the cell increases in size. S, the second phase of interphase, which is on the lower portion of the circle on the screen, in which the DNA is synthesized. And G2, in which the cell continues to grow and duplicates organelles in preparation for cell division. Then, following the conclusion of interphase, the cell goes into mitosis. And so you can see that on the screen if we follow the cursor at this particular line. And so on this next slide, we're going to transition into a discussion of mitosis. So mitosis occurs in four steps. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. P-M-A-T and there are certain events that occur within each phase. We begin on this particular slide with prophase. And so we look at this cell, as we look at the cell on the screen, we see that it is in prophase. We can tell it's in prophase because of a couple things. One is that the DNA has become condensed. We can see the individual chromosomes, and this cell has four chromosomes. So if we back up to interphase, what we notice is that the DNA is not condensed and we see all these squiggles that are found in the nucleus. We are unable to see the individual chromosomes. And so that's the first hallmark that tells us the cell is in prophase. We also notice that the nuclear envelope is starting to go away, starting to disappear. For a brief period of time, the cell is going to be without a nucleus. So that's prophase, the first stage of mitosis. The second stage of mitosis is metaphase. In metaphase, the chromosomes line up along the very center of the cell at a region referred to as the metaphase plate. The metaphase plate is not an actual structure, but is an imaginary line that runs through the middle of the cell along which all the chromosomes align themselves. So it's very easy to tell if a cell is in metaphase because all the cells will be located right there in the middle of the cell, as we see in this particular diagram. The third phase of mitosis is anaphase. And so in anaphase, the chromosomes are pulled apart. And that's what we see occurring here. The, the two sister chromatids, as you have learned about uh, previously in lecture, have been pulled apart at the centromere. So there's a centromere. And remind yourself, this is a sister chromatid. If we follow the cursor, this is a sister chromatid. They've been pulled apart and they're moving towards opposite ends of the cell. And so that's anaphase. That's the last stage of mitosis. And then we enter this stage we refer to as cytokinesis. In cytokinesis, a ring of actin, a type of protein, forms around the middle of the cell and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it pinches the cell into two brand new cells. 
And so following cytokinesis, uh, we end up with two new cells, and we want to remember those cells are identical. Each of those cells can then begin to undergo mitosis. And so you can see this is how growth occurs. One organism goes from, you know, in the, in the case of, uh, if you like a fish example, a striped bass starts out the size of a mosquito larva, barely visible, and grows to a size of perhaps 100 pounds, a huge five-foot-long or six-foot-long fish as a result of thousands of these mitotic divisions. You also increased in size from perhaps, what, seven pounds, eight pounds, to the, whatever it is, 150 pounds uh, that you are today as a result of these mitotic divisions. We wanna make one point at this particular time regarding cytokinesis. Now, cytokinesis, as you know, is the division of the cytoplasm. It's when the cell is actually pinched in two in the case of animal cells, as we saw in the previous slide. However, in the case of plant cells, it's impossible to pinch a cell in two. This is a result of the rigid cell wall that exists around plant cells. So, in the case of plant cells, what must be done is that a brand new cell wall is built within an existing cell. This brand new cell wall is referred to as a cell plate. That's what's shown in the middle of our diagram here. So, if you follow the cursor, this used to be one large cell what we see right here is a cell plate being formed, and that cell plate, which is an immature cell wall, is going to get thicker and thicker and thicker until it becomes like the other cell walls. And then those cells can expand and then divide in two again. No cell grows too much. Cells typically uh, double in size, perhaps, and then they split uh, in two. And so cells grow uh, a limited amount of time before they divide, and, and that's, of course, because one cell can't be too big or it eventually loses sufficient uh, surface area relative to the volume that it has to obtain oxygen and nutrients. So, to summarize, cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm. It happens via the pinching of an actin, which is a type of protein ring, in the case of animal cells. In the case of plant cells, a brand new cell wall is formed. We now begin our discussion of meiosis. Now, remember, meiosis serves one and only one purpose and that purpose is sexual reproduction. So the bottom line is meiosis creates the gametes, the eggs and the sperm, and nothing else. That's the purpose of meiosis. In order to understand meiosis, we need to understand the terms diploid and haploid. Diploid, D-I-P-L-O-I-D, and haploid, H-A-P-L-O-I-D, uh, as we see on the screen. I feel like this diagram is a very good diagram for understanding diploid and haploid. If we look at human chromosomes, what we notice is this. Human chromosomes are arranged into pairs. Human chromosomes are arranged into pairs. Here we see a karyotype, that is, a picture of all the chromosomes of a human being. And we notice that we have pair number 1, 2, 3, all the way down to pair number 22. Now, the one exception to these pairs are the sex chromosomes. The sex chromosomes are the X and Y chromosome. In humans, but not other animals, such as alligators and other reptiles, if we have two X chromosomes, then we have a female. If we have an X and Y chromosome, then we have a male. So we use the term diploid to refer to an organism that has two copies of every chromosome. There are also triploid organisms, three pairs of each copy, tetraploid organisms, um, and uh, haploid organisms, which have one copy of each chromosome. So, humans are diploid. The adult organisms are diploid, having two copies of each chromosome. If we go back to this diagram, then we can see very clearly the significance of diploid and haploid. What we notice is that, as I just mentioned, the adult human beings are diploid. The female and male are both diploid. Through the process of meiosis, the gametes are produced. And the gametes, uh, of course, in the case of the female are the egg and the sperm in the case of the male. So the gametes are haploid, and the haploid means they have half the number of chromosomes. So an adult human being, as we just mentioned, has 46 chromosomes. That's the diploid number. 2n is used to represent diploid. Dip, uh, the diploid number of chromosomes is 46. Haploid is represented by a single N, meaning half the number of chromosomes. The haploid number of chromosomes is 23. 
At fertilization, the egg and the sperm come together uh, to restore that diploid number. And so the zygote, which is the single-celled embryo, is diploid. And then the uh, child uh, is a diploid, the adult is diploid, but then the gametes are haploid. And so back and forth we go through the process of reproduction from diploid to haploid, diploid to haploid. And this is positive because it preserves the chromosome number in the organism, humans in this case. We want to take a moment and describe an event that occurs during the process of meiosis and one that you'll be asked about on your worksheet and on your quiz at this point of our lecture. This event is referred to as crossing over. In crossing over, two chromosomes trade segments of their DNA. And so what happens is the following. These have to be pairs of chromosomes. These pairs are referred to as homologous pairs. You saw, for instance, pair number one, pair number two, pair number three, and so forth. So all of those numbers are homologous pairs of chromosomes. So this could be pair number one. There's a blue one and a red one. The blue and red represent whether they came from that person's mother or father. If you think about your pairs of chromosomes, then they came from either your mother or your father. And so you will pass on one, but not both of these chromosomes, to your offspring. And so what happens is, each chromosome reaches out an arm and a segment breaks off of uh, each of these chromosomes and they trade segments. So it's an interesting process for sure. So now this blue chromosome, which we could say comes from that person's father, consists mainly of DNA that came from the father, but it swaps segments with the mother. So now it has a little bit of DNA that came from the mother. And the same thing applies uh, to the maternal chromosome, mostly maternal DNA with a little bit of paternal DNA. This is a means of providing a tremendous amount of diversity in the offspring. Remember, the big advantage of sexual reproduction is genetic diversity, and so this is one of those mechanisms that scrambles the DNA before the DNA is passed on to the offspring. We come now to meiosis, and what we see is this, that in the case of meiosis, we undergo two divisions and end up with four cells. This is in contrast to mitosis, in which we underwent one division and ended up with two cells. So the phases in many ways are similar to what we observed previously. What we see is that we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, but in this case we have meiosis 1 shown here and meiosis 2 shown in just a moment on the next slide. So in prophase 1, we see crossing over that we just talked about occurring, and we see the nuclear envelope going away. And that's how we recognize it's prophase 1. The cell at this point is diploid, so 2n, which means diploid equals 4. The diploid number of chromosomes is 1, 2, 3, 4, as we see on the screen. We then go to metaphase 1. We can tell this is metaphase 1 of meiosis because the homologous pairs of chromosomes are lined up along the metaphase plate lined up along the metaphase plate. So that's metaphase 1. In anaphase 1, the chromosomes themselves are pulled apart to opposite ends of the cell. And so we can tell it's anaphase 1 because the chromosomes are being pulled apart. The centromere, as you can see here, remains intact. In telophase 1, we develop a cleavage furrow, and at this point we've gone to haploid. So 2n means diploid, so n in this case means haploid, and n equals 2. So the haploid number of chromosomes in each cell is 1, 2, 1, 2. So each, there are two cells now, and each cell is haploid. We go down to meiosis 2. In meiosis 2, we go through the same steps uh, once again, but they're all labeled 2, and they're slightly different. The cells are all haploid now, so in prophase 2, the nuclear envelope goes away. In metaphase 2, the chromosomes themselves line up along the metaphase plate. This is really similar to what we saw in mitosis and the sister chromatids are going to separate there in anaphase 2, and then that takes us to telophase 2. And so at the end of telophase 2, we have one, two, three, four cells, and all of those cells have two chromosomes. They're all haploid. This is possible because the chromosomes entered this whole cycle duplicated. And what we've done in metaphase 2 is simply separate the sister chromatids. So at the end, each cell does not have duplicated chromosomes, but it does have two chromosomes what used to be sister chromatids that are found in each cell. So to summarize, in mitosis, which we talked about previously, we have one cell division and we end up with two cells and both those cells are diploid, identical to the parent cells. 
In the case of meiosis, we end up with four cells. Those cells are different as a result of crossing over, and those cells are haploid. The last thing I wanted to do is to take just a moment and to show you some cells that are in different phases of mitosis. Remember, you have a nice picture of these cells found on your lab worksheet, and you're asked to identify which stage the cells are in. So let's look at all four stages briefly. Remember, this is only mitosis, not meiosis. You won't be asked to do this with meiosis. So here we see a cell in prophase. I know this is a little different than what you expected, most likely based on the drawings, but this is what they actually look like underneath the scope. So we see the squiggly lines that uh, appear to, uh, that, that do indicate uh, the chromosomes are condensed, but we can't tell much about the position of the chromosomes. If we look over here, we see metaphase. And so metaphase uh, is, uh, we can tell it's metaphase because the squiggly lines are all lined up along the middle of the cell, along the so-called metaphase plate. This is anaphase, and we can tell it's anaphase because the chromosomes are being pulled apart to opposite ends of the cell. And then these cells are interphase, and they're interphase uh, because we can't see any DNA at all. Uh, those dark, dark structures are nucleoli uh, that, that are found within the cell, regions of RNA assembly that are of no direct uh, relation uh, to the uh, cell division process we're talking about now. But there's no squiggly lines, and therefore that indicates there's no condensed chromosomes that are visible within the nucleus uh, of the cell. And the nucleus is this circle that we see here. So let us know as you have questions as you go through uh, this particular uh, lab. And remember, there are two things to complete. One is the worksheet that you'll complete and turn in via Discovery. And the other is the lab quiz, also found in Discovery.